Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are all doing well. We're going to get started here. Um, just as I have mentioned earlier, um, we are recording this webinar, um, not webinar, this roundtable discussion, and it will be available um, through EOA best practices um, in, sometime in the near future. So um, please um, just keep that in mind, I guess. <laughs> Um, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Kaylee Laplander. I am in, uh, I'm the current president of MICAP, um, Michigan's College Access Programs and Personnel. Um, so thank you all for coming today. All right, we have a lot of people on today. How exciting. All right, so the, um, as you know, this time was set up for us to be able to um, really just have a chance to touch base as talent search workers. Um, I'm a talent search advisor, um, but figure out our best practices um, and the things that we are doing so that you are, um, we can share those ideas because um, in a world where we are living, we are living in a Zoom world, we are living in a virtual world, and um, there's a lot of people having to recreate the wheel right now. And um, it, that's not always necessary, right? Um, if we can, if we're willing to share our resources, that is fantastic. Um, so, um, if you are not speaking, some I guess some housekeeping rules, I guess for roundtables. Um, if you're not speaking, if you could keep yourself on mute, um, that just does it um, minimizes background noise and helps you hear other people better um, when they're speaking. So when it's time, if there's something you want to contribute or you're participating in part of a conversation, um, just make sure you unmute yourself. Um, and then once you're done, feel free to remute your re mute yourself um, whenever is necessary. Um, so, I guess kicking it off, um, how are people doing with um, reaching out to their students right now? Um, is anyone having issues with reaching out in a virtual format? Or have any questions? If there's any, oh, we're opening it up to questions. You got questions that you want answered? Yes, I'll kick it off for you, Kaylee. How you doing? <laughs> hello, hello. Um, I'm not having any problems reaching out to my students. Um, I think right now the problem is the participation of the students. So um, um, I reach out to them with no problem. Um, they op we know they're opening the emails. They see them. Um, I think it's just the participation, especially with the students being more nocturnal now. And so we're just working with the times that we present our workshops and those types of things and different formats besides Zoom, you know, other formats to get them participating. So I think that's just what I'm dealing with right now is just the participation of the students because I have talent search, two talent search programs. Okay. How many students are you serving between? One program I have 500, the other program I have 592. Wow. All right. Yeah. How are you able to reach them? Um, I, I apologize if I say your name incorrectly. Gao, can you repeat that? Oh, sorry, that was to um, people in my house. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, people can also, if they don't feel comfortable or having troubles with their mic, you can use the chat box um, as well. Um, Vivian says that they have been sending out information and activities to students. Um, it's just the interest and participation is pretty low. Um, and Lori asks how people, um, how do you, Laura, could you answer this question? How do you know that your students are opening your emails? They're responding to the email I sent. Okay. So they've opened it. And then some of my staff have been using GMAS and GMAS lets you know if the, um, if the document has been open, if the email has been open. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with that program, but I know there are a few programs that you can, um, yeah, you can track um, if you, if it's been opened. Um, so that's that's nice because you know they're getting it, right? <laughs> and we're also start but using if they don't respond, right? I think we're also we're going to start using MailerLite, um, which is similar to uh, Mailchimp. 
for our emails as well because they do the same thing. They track who's opening what and clicking on what links. So that way I have an idea, at least are they even receiving the information? So. Definitely. Yeah. MailChimp is probably one of the bigger ones that I'm familiar with. Um, it has been asked if we can make sure we share these um, apps and, or, and links. So yes, if you can please, um, if you have um, resources that you can share, um, please make sure you post them in the chat box for everybody. Uh, we've got several people saying that they use um, Remind um, and texts. We got also one call in social media to reach out to students. Jolanda says that they are having issues with phone numbers being disconnected. Uh, that's tough because how are you going to find them? <laughs> um, does anyone have anyone have any anyone else having that issue or have a good solution on how um, to deal with? Let's see, Jenkins. Um, I'm having issues, the same issues with telephone numbers being disconnected. Some of the numbers I have received um, as recently as in January and February, and they're no longer, um, you know, working. So it's very frustrating trying to reach students and get information out to them. And then, too, I know I send out emails, but I do a lot of emails with the Blooming System, and I guess I'll have to figure out how to get a receipt to see if they open it. The only way I know I found out from talking to some parents and follow up for some of the things I sent out, like for scholarship information or for like um, some of the virtual college tours, especially for my seniors and my juniors, um, the scholarship information in the college tours. By talking to parents, I was able to find out, well, oh, yeah, we did the um, Zoom. I mean, we got on the Zoom or we got on a virtual tour or we see, received your email. But that's only because I've asked, you know, I'll ask for them to respond to let me know that they received the information. But nobody's replying. They're just looking at it and doing whatever they need to do, but not replying. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I don't think um, our participants understand that we need them to, uh, we need to document what they do. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's great that you're doing it, but I need to know. <laughs> oh, goodness. Does anybody else have solutions on how to find, um, to connect with students whose phone numbers are disconnected? What does PPL stand for? I'm sorry, what was that? We have been doing some mailings. Oh. Mailings. Um, and we're doing a very simple bingo activity where, um, like, and a part of if they get bingo, our college is helping us get some incentives. Um, so, in the, the bingo pieces, it's like a task, like, uh, follow us on Facebook or, um, or like us on Facebook, it's a task, follow us on um, Instagram as a task, email and advisor as a task. So those are all little squares on the bingo. And then if they get bingo, they can mail that back to us. We send them a return postage to envelope as well. Um, and then, um, and we ask on there also for their well, phone number and email. I, we haven't, we're just sending that out now. Hopefully that will help us get some feedback and results kind of twofold there. Awesome, thank you, Lori. Um, some additional suggestions in the chat box, texting parents along with students. Um, hopefully, if, yeah, if you got two phone numbers, so at least somebody will get it. Um, messenger. Um, Melissa suggests contacting the school counselor. Um, that's a great idea um, to see if we can get, you can get a updated um, contact information if the school has it. Um, Sala says that they're doing, when they do virtual college tours, they have them fill out um, a form um, that they plan on attending. And I think that might be a good way if you can email them an activity. Um, a lot of times when we do 
Um, I, I work in a very rural, rural program. So whenever I do a needs assessment, I also have them complete um, an updated contact information. Um, so, um, yeah, a mailer or an email that says, hey, do this activity, and then also have those areas in there. Um, sending emails to parents as well as the students. Um, can I say something? This is DeAndre. How you doing? Hey, DeAndre. Um, and so I just, I wanted to know if others are having just a problem with, um, again, you know, how our program is based is no incentive behind really what we you know do at this time like a grade and things of the sort and then here in Illinois what we found out is that um, for whatever last standing grade that our students had that they are no matter if they do any more work moving forward they're stuck at that grade so if they had a C when all of this stuff happened they're stuck at a C even if they did the work or not. And so we have a lot of students that's not even doing school work. And so how are we engaging um, the students when again, we don't have grades to tie into them or anything else. And right now they don't care about their grades, but who's having a success around this? Feel free to unmute yourself and share. Um, I'm Ashley Fritz from Grand Valley's Trio Talent Search um, in Michigan, and I'll just share some of the things that we've been doing. I don't know if this really helps you, DeAndre, but um, obviously our students, th they luckily get to raise their grades, so that's a huge incentive that you're missing out on, unfortunately. But um, I do talk to them about there has been a lot of colleges posting, you know, SATs now aren't going to be in you know, a factor for admissions and things. And so I really try to drive home like the contents, what's important and placement testing for colleges. And when you miss out on this material, you're also, um, you know, not setting yourself up for the future. Uh, I know it's not an incentive really that they're seeing firsthand. Um, we also have created a learning challenge where we do a document that's on, um, it's on, uh, Google Drive doc and then we connect that doc with everything we post on there to a Google form so that they have to fill out a form that simply says their first name, last name, school, grade, uh, what they completed and one thing they learned from that. Um, so we're posting like tutor mentors, like there's success um, tutor mentor. We've had a couple students use that. It's free right now, I think until um, August or something like that. Um, and I can share that with you guys, um, as well as uh, some virtual um, campus tours or uh, any webinars that we have come up. We had with Raquel and Odell some webinars that we posted. Um, and again, the incentive side is the hardest side. Um, we have, again, your university has to define what you can have, but we did get approved list of learning aids. And we had, um, for those who completed, we did a drawing for them. And uh, we had stuff on there like a reading light, a backpack, um, a cool chair for like a quiet space for them, like an inflatable chair. Um, different learning aids. We labeled it as learning aids, not prizes. <laughs> um, and so that kind of tried to give some incentives. Um, that's another document I could share I created, but it's a, a bunch of um, things that our university passes as okay to give as incentives um, and buy and purchase. Uh, again, food and gift cards are the things they want the most and we cannot do that. So uh, we do run into the same issues you are having, but maybe there's some ideas in there that help you out a little bit. Thank you. Anyone else on that question? And I will add, I think we're having the same issue even with all that stuff going on, like school is starting back up and I've had students reach out and apologize to me like, sorry, I haven't been involved, Ms. Fritz. Like, 
they've been doing their schoolwork and stuff and I just tell them like that's great you're doing your schoolwork or like just keeping in contact in that relational um, aspect and just letting me know and then not like trying to force on trio stuff like okay that's great but I hope you do you know get the time to participate here in the near future but that's great you're focusing on um, on schoolwork and just keep me posted is the main thing like I really like that a relational part where they're just letting me know what is going on um, but we, we struggle with the exact same things I'm sure we'll do the exact same thing then. Awesome, thanks, Ashley. Um, some questions are coming in yeah. on the chat box, so just so you can keep track of those, and so that we will make sure we get to them. I'm also not sure if anyone else has done Google Classroom. We are starting to launch this too. Um, this is something that our schools are already using with their teachers during this remote time. So we thought it would be a good time for us to test drive it because um, they're already getting that experience and they probably have more experience than us at this point um, with their teachers using it. And we're trying to get it so that all those Google Docs and everything is one classroom, one platform. Um, we use Remind a lot for reminders, but it'd be nice to link all their emails. And again, for that connection of trying to reach students, we are reaching out to all of our counselors in the schools and asking for correctly updated emails. Um, it's a lot of work for them, but you know, we're partnering with them. We're trying all for the same goal in the end. So um, I, we, we've been trying to tell them, like, we understand you're super busy right now, um, but as soon as you can, and they've been kind of shooting over a little little bits of emails, um, you know, maybe per grade or something at a time when they can complete that. And we're hoping to go to that Google platform as well. But I am also curious as if anyone has used it already. This is um, Jackie Lafuente with Emporia State University Trio Talent Search. And I've been using Google Class um, for about three weeks now. Um, I try to make it very light, as light as possible. I try to post one material per week, and then I add about two, three questions they need to answer about that material back. And then they earn points, and when they reach um, 500 points, they will get an incentive at the end. Now, um, the thing about Google Classroom is you can send the invite to all the kids, but they still have to sort of accept to get into the classroom. And so I haven't had all the students getting into the Google Class. I have sent an invite to all of them, and there is a possibility that a lot of them do not have internet services of any kind, so they are not in it for that reason. Um, I am impressed by the responses I'm getting in those um, um, questions that I'm sending because they are actually processing things and being very thoughtful about it. I have been doing a lot of um, self-care uh, tips on how to succeed on a virtual classroom, that kind of thing that is more related to what they are going through at the moment. Um, now, even with all those things, I still haven't been able to reach all my students, or maybe I reach, but I don't know if they have processed anything. I have used Google Class, Zoom meetings for workshop um, about once a week or every other week. I have used messengers for the one that have it. I have used emails requesting a receipt, and they don't even click that receipt box. <laughs> so. I don't know, again, and, and that would be close to a quarter of the students that I haven't had any kind of um, communication response back. So, and again, there is a percentage of those ones that their phone number is not the current one, is disconnected, um, whatever the reason that might be, either because they changed the number or before all this happened, they got disconnected, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what the other option to those students. We have tried mailing, um, but again, it's a choice for them to respond back in any way, shape, or form. And that's the part I have no idea how to convince them to re respond back even if we try all those things.
Yeah, it's definitely an issue, really hard thing when you cannot just go seek them out in the school. Um, it definitely makes our job a lot tougher. Um, something that was touched on there and was one of the questions that we had, um, what are we, what are people doing with, um, for students who have limited access to technology and or internet? This was a question from Donna. Some of our schools around, uh, sorry, Kim Campbell from Iowa Lakes Community College in Northwest Iowa. Uh, some of our schools around here have opened up internet so that students can go to the parking lots to, to get internet access so that they can do their homework. Um, we live in a very rural part of Iowa, and so that seems to have um, helped with those. Of course, if parents work during the day, then you have that issue of how is the student supposed to get to the parking lot. Um, but that's what some of the schools around our areas have done. Thanks, Kim. Hello, this is Shell Lao Dumare, um, Sinclair College in Dayton, Ohio, Talent Search Project Director. Our district, the Dayton uh, Public Schools District, has um, deployed school buses with Wi-Fi hotspots to the neighborhoods, and so they have a schedule um, all set up where the buses stay in the neighborhoods for a couple of hours at a time. Um, it's still not super ideal because we know that some families are working on one device and there may be multiple students using the same device during that window, but it is an option that they've um, set up also for all of the seniors and juniors, <coughs> excuse me, they issued them hotspots so that the seniors and juniors who are needing to complete, you know, graduation requirements and all of that, especially they have individual hotspots that they received from the district. Then the district also issued Chromebooks out to all of the students to use as well. So uh, for our program, we'll feel, fill in those gaps as needed. And then also we're looking at our, for our summer program, possibly getting uh, Chromebooks with data plans. Now we've not worked through all those logistics in terms of, you know, off hours, would they still be using, you know, the Chromebooks for other purposes, but we're, we're looking into having the data plan already built into to the Chromebook so that access and hardware won't be an issue for our summer. This is Amanda Pratt from uh, College Now Greater Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Talent Search Program. Uh, PCs for People is a national organization that offers uh, free PCs. They're used on refurbished PCs uh, for families to be able to pick up. So here in Cleveland, Ohio, um, in addition to the efforts from the school districts to distribute Chromebooks, PCs for People will give students um, free computers that they can have at home, which are unrestricted, like the, uh, you know, the school Chromebooks, which can sometimes um, prohibit certain activities that we may need to use to connect with students. Um, so anybody can reach out to them to be able to put that. And I will, I see Carolyn, uh, I will put it in the chat, but it was PCs for People. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. Our districts have been doing, can you hear me, Kelly? I turned my... You're good. Okay. okay. Um, our districts, hello, everybody, again. Our districts have been doing the same thing with the school buses, et cetera. Um, but also, I know Charter is offering our, is offering our students in our communities and their parents, um, those who do not have Charter, they're offering them service as well. So Charter has been working to do the same thing. And I think in the Chicago land area, I think Comcast is one of the, the major um, companies that's been doing the same thing, offering services to, to um, families that have students of school age students in their home. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think if there's been anything else. We're still trying to figure out, we sent out a technology survey to our students to see what their needs were because a lot of our districts did, well, the, all the districts we worked with offered Chromebooks to the students. So um, some of them, the problem that we did encounter was the students not picking them up. 
So I'm not going to get the Chromebooks from the schools. Um, so when I sent out the technology survey, it didn't, the internet wasn't a problem for my students. Um, we had maybe a few students that said that they had no internet, no internet access, but for the most part, the students that participated had it. Um, so right now we're still in the process of trying to find out who needs it and how can we assist and fill in where the school districts or the um, major companies have not been able to be successful with our students. Awesome. Um, somebody mentioned that, yeah, this, some schools have been providing paper packets for the students who don't have access to the internet or hardware. Um, I don't know about all the states. I know in Michigan, um, our executive order 2020-35 did state that the schools are required to provide alternate uh, means of schooling if for families that are not connected. Um, to the internet. I know we have, um, like I said, I'm in a very rural area and I also live in an area that has, um, it's not uncommon for people to have more than five children um, in their house. Like sometimes we've got families that have up eight to 12 children per household. So having one computer is also, you, know, you can have access, but it doesn't help them <laughs> when five to seven children need to be on the computer during the day. Um, so I think this is a place for advocacy. Um, so if you ha find out your student is, does not have internet access um, until something can be figured out for them um, to advocate on behalf of that student um, to the counselor and say, the student is not receiving the services um, and the assignments that they need, um, you'll have to check your executive orders or um, whatever's going on in your state um, if that's a, re a requirement. But um, I think that's kind of just a common sense area. Well, we are very technologically involved these days, um, our students are the ones that are likely not to have access, so. I totally agree with that. And I feel that maybe that's perhaps one of the reasons those students didn't pick up those Chromebooks because they never got that message somehow. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is one of the things that I hear often from my students, the one that are able to attend their classes is that they are feeling extremely overwhelmed yeah. with everything that was thrown at them. Um, they are not used to work independently in homework because all their life they have been doing homework at school and they never took homework at home. And then the other part is when they are at home, they also have added responsibilities now because some of the parents are still working so especially the older kids are in charge of the younger kids. Mm -hmm. So while they are trying to attend class here, they are trying to take care of their smaller siblings or feeding them or doing all these other things that might need their attention at the same time. So the ones that I hear feedback from are very, very overwhelmed. Some of the older kids have gotten jobs if they could because they wanted to help the family in this situation. Yeah, I, I, when I went grocery shopping, my Walmart is primarily staffed by teenagers right now, <laughs> which is scary to think that they're working a 40 hour job right now and not doing their schoolwork. Um, yeah, again, and that's our population. Our population is going to be the ones who feel the need to contribute um, because this is their opportunity whether it is in childcare or a job. Um, so how are we helping our students um, with the, emo the social emotional aspect of being overwhelmed? Does anyone have good ideas on that? Hi, this is Amanda again. So I think for our team, we're just trying to be flexible because as we go along, we discover something new every week. I um, mean, one of those things was, of course, that the students are waking up later, you know, and some of it is because they have free reign with time. Other aspects of it are because they are depressed. And so we really try to either have them connect with us and we try to make ourselves available after hours. We try to connect them with the um, county hospitals and clinics and different things who are offering phone calls. Um, for health services and then also telehealth services when people have internet access. Um, we try to work with the faith community who is 
um, making phone calls to families because of the increase in child abuse cases. Um, and so reaching out for that and also the other, you know, layers of issues that have come along with people being at home so much with each other. Um, so we're just, we're connecting with every community resource that we possibly can to make sure that students continue to get uninterrupted social emotional support. That's great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I have been running Tuesday, I run Trio Tuesday uh, webinars. And, but the thing is I don't do them live because as has been said, our students are, um, their sleep schedules are, a lot of them are changed. Um, so they have the ability to lo to go in and find it. It's on YouTube. Um, and I, I pre-record everything. And then they have a sign in. And this week's um, focus was on finding calm during chaos. And um, when I asked them to sign in for this one on a Google form, um, I gave them a scale that went from great, very good, good, neutral, bad, very bad, and awful, I'm depressed, um, that they could literally just check one, um, and then I can respond accordingly. I can, you know, follow up with those students that way. Um, but again, if you've got students that are depressed, they may not be participating. Does anyone else have stuff on how they're helping on the social emotional? side of things we are going to do pre-recorded workshops as well with a mental health trauma consultant and she's going to also offer our students virtual zone classes and yoga and meditation so um but like you said hopefully we we make ourselves available to our students as much as possible we're always reaching out to them if if we're not reaching them via email we're always on the telephone talking to them um, just like somebody said earlier, being flexible with them, letting them know that we haven't went anywhere, that we're here. We're going to start motivational Mondays with our students to send them something motivational to get them through the week. Um, so we're just kind of playing it by ear, like, you know, just to say what somebody said earlier is changing. Every day we find out something new. So we just want to make sure that they know, like we were when we were in the building, that we're there for them and we are still something that's consistent for them if they need us. So those are some things that we're trying right now. And um, I'll follow up. This is DeAndre with Laura. Uh, and I think that's very important at this time too, when we're able to kind of speak with the students, they kind of need to hear that. I know as we were surveying and also talking to students as well, um, they're talking about everything that they don't have in order to be successful um, you know, during this time and just reiterating the purpose of us. And that's what I was telling them. Uh, a lot of our students, that's why we're here as TRIO programs. We can't put the fault 100% on your teachers. You know, they're running classrooms. A lot of the times they can't offer these resources, but you all are lucky to have programs like TRIO in place to be able to support you in these specific areas. And just listening to what they're saying and offering the programs that they really need. And I think that's what's been helping us drive the number of students, uh, help work with those students even more, giving them what they thought they didn't have. Like right now, even financial lessons, you know, if, you know, everything, which we give all the time, but now they're ready to listen to it. You know, now it's like, well, we should be getting this, we should be getting this. And so just making sure we go back with what we already bring. I just want to add too, this is Primavera with um, Central Michigan University's Educational Talent Search Program. And we're based out of Detroit. And so I know that there's been a lot of focus on like academics, but we decided with our program to make that shift more so like a social emotional support for our students because our students being in Detroit that's a hot spot which I'm sure some of your cities also have those hot spots but our students are being affected directly by this um, and so we just try to do things fun and so we do virtual uh, meetups and so we still incorporate the educational but we do it in a fun way so we'll do educational games yesterday we just did a um, what was it called team Oh, the escape room. We did the escape room where they had to work together as a team, problem solve, figure out math problems. Um, so there's still that educational component, but they're having fun doing it. And our shift has just really just been focusing on their well-being opposed to stressing, getting your work done, you know, fill out your packets, check in with your school. So we're just that social emotional support with our students. And we have seen an increase in engagement because of that shift too. Um, more students are engaging virtually through our sessions, um, and so that's a good thing. 
Primavera, the virtual room was, it was a virtual escape room. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And I can share that. Um, it was free too. So I can share that resource in this chat room. Let me see if I can bring it over. Yeah, please. Because our students love the escape rooms and I didn't even think to think about them from a virtual standpoint. Thank you for that. So yes. We, I um, saw one. It was very expensive. Very, very expensive. <laughs> We did the, the free version. There might be some paid versions, but we just split it up. We did it through Zoom. We broke out a breakout rooms. We split the students and staff in it, and we kind of competed against each other. Um, so it was fun. It was fun. I'll stop it in the chat. Thank you. Fantastic. Earlier, Donna asked, um, how are you guys working on checking on course rigor when people are um, where schools are using pass-fail grades. Um, does anyone have any follow-up to that? How they're marking course rigor? I don't have a specific response, but we typically go with whatever the state says. So if the state says there is rigor, then we just maintain what the state says. Okay, thanks. I think this might be one of those areas that um, we would love some guidance from the Department of Ed. No fact. What's questions that we're still waiting on? Sorry, DeAndre, could you repeat that? No, just the FAQs that we're still waiting on. Hopefully, you know, the response is somewhere in those FAQs if we ever get them. So. Yeah. So I think Rick, what you wrote in your grant, though. Yep, follow, so follow what, what's written in the grant as best possible. Because that's how you determine your rigorous. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nikki. We did send out an email to parents and students because um, we are having the same, you know, some schools are just passing them or what the grade that they have. And so it could always be overturned. So we encourage the students to seek us out. We also encourage the students not to settle for that GPA if they have a low one to keep striving for it because it affects scholarships. And especially if you're a ninth grader, this is the start of your um, career. And so for, for um, scholarships, so we did have some people respond to that and they were thankful that we gave them an uplifting word don't stop, we're almost done, keep moving on. And so I would encourage everybody to, you know, try to put a motivational word in to have the students not stop motivating themselves. They only have a couple more weeks left. Um, there was one other topic I wanted to talk about a little bit. Has anybody ever done a talent search app? A talent search app? Um, my program did have one. And how did, well did it go over? Um, no. <laughs> um, I mean, our app was just essentially connected to our, our individual website. or um, We have an independent website from our university um, so that we can moderate the content easier. Um, so the app was really just, um, it brought you to different pages on the website. Um, I, I just didn't, it didn't find it to be a great way to connect with students because then they had to have it. And for Well, what we're finding out is that more and more, it doesn't matter what grade that they're in, they have a cell phone. So we're trying to be proactive. And if there was supposed to be another go about this whole Corona thing, what are we going to do next year? So if we could get students to download the talent search app which would have it wouldn't really have any personal information just if they move they could put their new app and it would come to us and then we put it in our blooming or whatever but it also be a, like a reminder about you know trips or any of those other things act um and then when we do uh webinars or um, we could refer to the app, and I was just wondering if it if it worked out or not because we could put a lot of information on it, and and kids would download the app, and that way they could always be connected. But I just wanted to see what everybody's feedback is because 
the more stuff you put on the app, it goes from like five thousand to ten thousand dollars. Uh, this is Tim Tim Hambay from St. Louis University. I would recommend, or I would at least uh, suggest considering a Facebook group page. Um, that right there gives you the uh, that like the longevity um, of a lifelong connection. As long as you have an active group page, when your members go off to college or you know go X amount or go anywhere, they can always go back to their group page as opposed to an app. I delete apps whenever I want to clean up my phone. Thanks, Tim. Does anybody else have experience with having an app that can help Nikki? All right. Um, so the next question we have is, um, how are you working with your seniors, um, specifically having um, their senior years ended abrupt, abruptly, and how is this affecting them? And do you see that your students, your seniors' plans are changing as a result of COVID-19? So we're hearing from our students um, that a couple of things. One, that they're considering going to community college in lieu of a four-year um, college or university because um, they, they want to live on campus, ultimately, and they want to be able to have that interaction. And then there's another part of students who are persisting, and despite, you know, needing to prepare for online education, they are still going forward with their original plan to attend the four-year. Uh, but on both sides, you know, students are nervous because the assumption is that they know um, how to operate on the digital space in terms of education. But we know from many of our students who are first generation who don't have consistent access to internet or computers at home and all of the different layers of, you know, a change in educational landscape that they are the most vulnerable students. And uh, we've been making a lot of phone calls to make sure that they still persist and that they go to college. And we're also talking to colleges and letting them know that this is what our students are saying um, about getting ready to transition. But ultimately, you know, from the student's perspective, for those of you who are in the college space, um, they want to know about orientation programs and um, what they need to do to get ready for orientation programs. They want to know what classes they need to take so that they can prepare. They want to practice using the systems that uh, they will be using for their classes and different things like that. And they also want to know who the people are that they can connect with on campus to um, help support them while they're doing all of that. So they're looking for mentorship as well. Thanks for that. Anybody else have stuff about seniors? How this is affecting them? Um, I will just add that we also have been doing like a senior Zoom and um, it's just for the, the seniors and we've asked from our community college to have, we, we just, Grand Rapids just became a promise zone. So we had someone from um, GRCC come and talk with our students. We've also tried to let them know um, what the barriers are going to look like and that it might not look what they, you know, had originally thought it would look like. Um, students who were doing dual enrollment and things like that have kind of already got that experience and we've asked them what their take has been on these last couple of months finishing college remotely. And the biggest thing is, is really those skills of um, not procrastinating commitment. They don't have a class to go to now, a professor to hold them accountable. So just talking to our seniors about that 
Um, and the second thing is TRIO SSS. We had GRCC also connect with us to talk. We're trying to get as many students in TRIO SSS programs at universities, um, wherever they're going, if there is one, just so that they get that extra support and um, person to kind of help walk them through any of those barriers or linking them to uh, the resources like learning centers or tutoring or writing centers and stuff that, you know, being a freshman, normally you would walk around campus and hear this stuff. And if, if that's not the case, they still can get that information. So um, I think the Zoom and just keeping our, our seniors um, still encouraged and hope that, you know, it might be okay and it might go back to normal, but there, there's the reality of it and to prepare for whatever that looks like. I run a um, six week online intensive that I've been doing for the last few years um, on summer melt prevention with my seniors, um, where it's often, it's a video to have them watch and then, um, or an article, something that they need to learn from and then a Google form um, to answer some questions and let me know where they're at. Um, and I'm thinking I'm gonna have to like rebrand or redo a lot of my stuff because this year because, um, the, the scope has changed. The view forward has changed for our seniors. Um, so, unless there's more to talk about for seniors. Um, Kim, I can send you my information on Summer Melt. I see that in the chat, chat box. Um, so some people have had questions about Schoolology, Google Classrooms, um, there's other versions out there, um, those ways to connect with students. Um, does anyone have preferences or best practices on utilizing those virtual classroom formats? Hi all, my name is Caroline, um, Century College Talent Search in Minnesota. Um, I posted about Schoology. I think the thing about that is honestly the district has Schoology, so that was sort of a, a suggestion if your district has Schoology, working with them to like create a group online with it. I think you can buy Schoology separately, um, but I mean the nice thing about going through the district is all the kids are already on it and they have to be on it for school. Um, so we've had more luck with it. It does speak, speak back to, I know um, someone had mentioned Facebook and other social media, so if you feel safe um, or have ways to safely use those tools, um, the luck that we've had on Schoology is in sort of creating little conversation starters, um, school by school, um, just, just trying to engage the kids um, with really simple questions. Um, sometimes it's not related to anything about All right, it looks like we lost Caroline, um, or I, I couldn't quite hear her um, near the end there. Um, I know Google Classroom, I believe you have to have email addresses that are all, um, the students all need to have the same at edu email address. So I know for my program, I have 16 schools, that is 16 different, um, I would need to get an email address from 16 different schools in order to do that, unless someone knows a way around that. <laughs> Um, would someone like to share about their um, cahoots that they've been doing? Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the chat box about Kahoot. 
Uh, somebody who has a lot of experience with that, if you could explain what that is and how you're using it, that would be awesome. Hello. I'm Selma, and I'm from UNL, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Talent Search. And I'm the one that mentioned about using Kahoot because we kind of, for my very first um, virtual club, since I usually meet with, for all the different clubs that I run, um, at, for our middle schools, we meet at least once a week during the, like at their school. But when I started doing the virtual like Zoom club, I didn't want to do like a lot of educational things that was kind of like an added stress to what they were already doing with schoolwork. So we started doing, for my first one, we did a Kahoot. You can create your own Kahoot, like, um, like create a PowerPoint or something and then put a timer to like how long, maybe like 20, 30, 40 seconds, however long you want them to get the question and then they sign in they can sign in with the code that pops up from your account that you create as like the teacher and then they sign in through their phone, through, um, they could do it on their computer. They just have to go to the website, type in like a five letter code and then they're in. And then eventually at the very end of it, it'll rank them like first winner, second winner, third winner. Um, there's already a lot of educational cahoots that are created as well if you don't want to create your own, they're on there. Um, so Melissa asks, how does Kahoot work um, be, work through Zoom? Do you have um, strategies on that, Selma? Or how does that yeah, work? Um, yeah, I signed in on, so we'll sign in, me or the other ETS mentor that is in there with me, like co-hosting it, either myself or she will sign in on the, her Kahoot account, and then we screen share for the students to see the game. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Um, Raven asks um, that if they would need to use their cell phone or their computer. Yes, um, cell phone, computer, tablet. They just they would need to go to a website. Yes, they could do it on that same computer that they're logged in for Zoom. We just tell them to open a different screen on the side. Okay. Um, there's been a few questions about people using STEM money. Uh, what a great year to get extra money this year. <laughs> um, does anyone have any ideas? I know it looks like um, E. Fuller is talking about um, STEM camps. Uh, there's been talk of STEM kits going home to students and anyone want to share information about that, what their ideas are? Um, yeah, we, um, I'm with a talent search at the University of Arkansas and we had um, planned on sending our students to an on-campus STEM camp with our College of Engineering. So of course that's not happening. We had about 58 students signed up. So we found an online source called Kiwico or K-I-W-I-C-O and they do STEM kits where students can make something and they, a lot of them have additional information on, uh, you know, what they're doing. So if they're making a, uh, a circuit out of slime, with slime, it explains circuits or if they're making, um, something else like um, trying to think of some of the things they have. They have a variety of items that you can choose from. And so we, um, after listening to COE telling us we needed to spend up our STEM money, um, we decided we better get some things out. And so they gave us a three month subscription. Um, they're gonna get their first kit next week. And um, you can send them an Excel spreadsheet with their home addresses and so we just made phone calls so they'd know where it was coming from and who was sending it and are asking them to post stuff to Instagram. So, um, but would love to hear what other programs are also doing if they're spending their STEM money. That's 
Awesome. Thank you. What else are people doing for STEM this year? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Munoz. I'm with CMU Trio Detroit Talent Search. And with our STEM, we are planning a STEM week for May 11th through the 15th. And our partners are doing virtual workshops. So they're doing a video game design with students and just helping them on coding. That's awesome. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. I had a question, Brian. Is that um, STEM week? Is that going to be virtual or in person? Hey, Alejo, well, that is virtual. Okay. Uh, okay. Students, they have a sign up registration that they uh, fill out on the Google form. Mm -hmm. And we just contact the parents and all of them for the information. But as of now, they do need a requirement to have internet access and a laptop, too. That's cool. Well, the Lance and School District just um, they're supplying all of our students with the Chromebook, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this some other time, brother. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, to go back to the jump back to Kahoot, somebody asks if. Um, students only have a cell phone. Are they able to Zoom and, and Kahoot at the same time if they only have a cell phone? I'm not sure about that. I don't, I think all the students that I've been meeting with were using their school Chromebooks. So I'm not sure how that would work with the cell phone. I okay. think I'd have to play around with that a little. All right. Um, Kim says she's purchasing laptops and tablets um, and tech tech tubs um, that charge that our outreach advisors can use and take into schools. Um, but, and that was written originally in your STEM grant. Um, photo study and professional development. Um, and working on moving trips to virtual in terms of STEM trips. This is Shola again from Sinclair in Dayton. Um, we don't have, we didn't get the STEM money, but we do have written into our grant where we're required to have a summer program. And so I'm just curious about what some other folks may be doing for summer programming that have that written into their grants. Um, we typically do a two to three week bridge program for our rising ninth graders um, to transition from middle school to high school. And we have academic programming and we have um, supplemental enrichment field trips on a normal, you know, that's how we typically run it. So now just trying to look at how we're going to transition that to a virtual format. I did have a meeting with Focus Training and they talked about some of their offerings that they're doing with um, summer program, how pro programming, how they've shifted from in-person to virtual. So just wanting to get some ideas from folks about what you all may be doing with summer programs that you have with your talent search students. Thanks. Hi, Shola. This is Kim again from Iowa Lakes Community College, Northwest Iowa. Part of our um, our grant has written in it a STEM camp for a week in um, June for our uh, sixth and seventh graders. And so this year we are partnering with uh, Paradigm Shift. And usually if the students come onto campus, we serve about 88 of them. Um, obviously this year, our numbers probably won't be that high, um, but Paradigm Shift puts together the kits and then we're going to have a uh, area for parents to come and pick up the, you know, one drop off point for them to pick up the kits. Um, they do a check-in in the morning at 10 o'clock. 
Uh, again, addressing there that they're not getting up very early in the morning. And so they check in with Paradigm Shift. Then during the day, they participate or do the kit activities and then check in again at two o'clock uh, with Paradigm Shift again and us as a staff uh, to see how everything went, checking in with them, um, things like that. So um, that way everything is provided in this kit. Uh, there are some things that they, that doesn't come in the kit that we're going to supplement for them so they can participate in the activities, but that's what we're doing for our STEM camp this year. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. I know somebody, um, I think this will tie in with the summer programs um, because it was mentioned, the paradigm shift and focus training. Um, that was another question I saw earlier in the chat box that we didn't get to. Um, so are people, so people who are familiar with paradigm shift and focus training, um, if you've used them in the past, um, if you think they'd be a good resource for summer programs, can you share a little bit about your experience with them? Um, yeah, we used Paradigm Shift to introduce a summer camp. They did some um, icebreaker activities for us last year, and they're awesome. They're a great company to work with. Um, wasn't aware that they were doing some online camps, so but they're they're a good company. I think uh, um, I don't know what like I said what they're doing for online stuff. I sat in on a something the other day they offered, <clears throat> which wasn't a lot of help, but that doesn't mean anything. So. Um, um, but they're definitely worth checking out. So. I agree with that. Um, we've had Paradigm Shift uh, quite a few times for our state conferences here in Iowa and, um, and have started using them to present with students and such as that. Um, they're great to work with. Uh, you know, our one main question was, will these kits be ready for our STEM camp that's gonna be held in June? And they've been great to work with and, you know, we'll get those kits to you and uh, really supporting us. Uh, so yeah, I encourage you to reach out. Awesome, thank you. What about focus training? Has anyone got experience with focus training? I know they email me a lot, but I don't you I haven't yet to use them. <laughs> This is Jill again. No, like I was saying, I had a meeting this week with one of the reps, and um, he talked about how the format would be where there's like um, a, an orientation kickoff that's alive with one of their trainers, and then um, there are like activities and assignments for the students to complete, um, you know, all virtually. And then these checkpoints, and then also they can build into their price, them providing the incentives. So like doing like a daily raffle for all of the students who've participated in the activities that day, and then a big kind of completion incentive for all of the students who, um, you know, persist through the end that could be built into the price or not. Um, and they typically had it set up for, for three days, but he said that they could adapt it for a week or two. Um, or three as needed. So he did send over some follow information just this morning. I've not yet gone through it all yet because we just met yesterday. Um, but so that's all I've got <laughs> so far. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. We are 
were thinking about holding our summer program instead of doing it in June, maybe do it in July, and maybe things will get better by then as far as activities go in places. We can hope, hey. <laughs> um, Ashley was asking a question about how many days are people doing their camps for? Um, two days a week, different days um, per week, or anything? Any ideas on? I know we, we did hear um, 10 to 2. Is there anybody else planning different times? Hi, uh, this is Andrea uh, with CMU Trio Detroit Talent Search. We're still in the process of developing the format for our summer academy, but one thing that we have um, pretty much determined is that if we do anything that requires our students to engage with us live, it will be in the late afternoon. Um, this was something that we learned through just our standard programming now. So we started trying to do live sessions with our students between 12 and 3. We were getting no students to attend. Then we later learned that they were still sleeping um, around that time. Um, since then, we've been pushing all of our um, our programming to six to begin at six p.m. to run from six to seven. Um, and we've gotten, I mean, like our numbers have more than tripled in terms of attendance. So we we really acknowledge that our students are more likely to engage in the early evenings. And so I think that even with our summer academy format, we will be looking to those schedules um, for that as well. Awesome, thanks Andrea. everybody. Um, I am Sharon Logan. I'm from Ada S. McKinley in Chicago. Um, Andrea, I really appreciated that last comment because one thing that we're really working with with our virtual classrooms and the talent search, um, we don't really have summer programming, but um, for our 9th through 12th graders, other than on an individual basis, um, we're working with them so we don't have to plan like a summer camp. So we definitely work with them in the summertime, go on tours, um, things like that. Um, with, but one thing that we have been working through is trying to get them up and online virtually because we have moved um, to a pretty robust virtual format and um, that was so i'm eager to go back and share that with our team of specialists that work from even that don't work with high school with elementary school students as well because we are really we were really missing it's not just us the, the schools that we're working with as well too trying to get them logged on in the morning so i really appreciate that I'm, i put that in my notes to go back to try in the evening in the later hours yeah, it really has made a crazy difference. And we were experimenting those first few weeks with different times and just kept pushing to later and later. Six to seven seems to be that sweet spot for us. Um, we went from having um, three to five people attend to having 15 to 25 students attend. So for us, that felt like a very, very big victory. Um, so we want to continue and also for consistency, now that we have our students um, attending more routinely, we've, we're seeing the same faces, we, we would like to keep that moving forward for, for their own consistency as well. Yeah, great, great. I appreciate that. I'm just curious, has anyone explored offering their programming with like Instagram Live? What question is anybody using Instagram Live? You know, honestly with um, our students, I'm gonna tell you the truth, I've used every platform I could find if we can't, <laughs> if, we're not, if we can't get them. Now, I haven't done a, because I don't have two separate, I personally haven't run a live. I thought about doing a couple of community-based lives just for information, period. But as for servicing our students, then um, I haven't done a, because I don't personally have a separate um, Instagram with 
um, our agency, I think that they have all of that, but then getting the students, my issue was getting the students, you know, then you have to get them to add your, your agency page and, you know, all of that. So, but I have definitely contacted them from Instagram and Messenger, Facebook Messenger. I don't have Snapchat, so I don't, I don't contact them through that, but any way that I, and I have noticed, um, I guess piggybacking on what Andre was, Andrea was saying was that I have noticed now that I'm thinking about it, when I DM them in the evening, I get a, a reply right away, right away. Um, we did try one live session and we just didn't get around to doing another one. Um, but the one that we did, I think it was one of the very first workshops that we released um, when everything kind of shut down. And we, it was actually pretty successful. Um, we already had some, some movement and some, you know, um, like some, some students following us on our Instagram. So it, it wasn't that we were starting from scratch. And so I think that also helped. Um, we did an Insta Live session. It was actually me and I spoke about financial aid and just um, reading award letters. And um, I was worried initially when I did it that I was going to have to lead the entire conversation. Um, but we ended up having 22 students attend that live session. They were very... Um, engaging they had great questions um it ran about 40 minutes it was it was actually a very pleasant surprise it worked really well and the feedback at the end of it was that they did enjoy it i think they enjoyed um engaging on a platform that was very normal to them that was kind of you know on their level um we had every intention of having more than one session and we just haven't gotten around to programming different topics for it but i would say that it, it was pretty effective Wonderful. So there's a question about recruitment for the fall um, in the chat box. Um, is anybody thinking about recruitment for the fall right now? Um, EFLR usually has um, August and September. Um, is there kind of prime time when they are recruiting um, and they are starting to plan some kind of virtual recruitment to be ready as a just in case. Um, because I, as we hear, I, I expanding on that, as we hear the possibility of a uh, second round of this in the fall, um, that's a, I know that's an area of concern of ours as how do we keep our programs, especially being programs that we have such high numbers that we have to fill each year. So anybody have ideas on how to be ready for a virtual or non-school-based recruitment? So what I, um, look, me again. <laughs> so what I had been um, thinking about, of course, um, I had kind of been thinking about forcing myself to use more of the social media because at the point that um, we're ending, like I, I believe that if you stay in focus with your students that you're servicing this year, um, working heavily with your um, students that are going to repeat like your 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, or 6th, 7th, 8th, you know, working close with them so they know that it's a continuing. That's one thing that I have been thinking a lot about is, you know, students reminding them that, you know, this is the way that you keep getting in contact with me, um, electronic, being able to say, but I, I really, I have been trying to wrap the type of campaign now because I, I, I don't think we're going to be able to wait until the fall to think about it. So I, I had that. That's what I had to think about. I was forcing myself to use because I, I use social media to feel like I really could. Um, Donna suggests having your talent search application available online, um, in which they can electronically sign and date it, um, and then send it to to school emails. Um, in upcoming grades that you would normally recruit. It's a great idea. Um, 
start getting that application prepped and ready. Um, we were just looking at software today to make fillable forms. That was um, rather our upward bound program is. So it's a good idea to start getting that prepared um, in case it comes to that in the fall. Um, Raven asked Donna if you're using DocuSign uh, for that or are you using um, an Adobe? Donna's using OnBase um, and, and her institution is setting it up. So, okay, that's awesome. It's fantastic. Um, I know that I have been a uh, big thing on my list in the past year has been uh, making our programs very visible in our community um, and make sure that we are finding ways to get at um, our students as well as their peers that maybe are not in our programs. Um, so one of the things I've done is I've built up good relationships with two radio stations in my community. And um, so I had regular, during the school year, I had semi-regular spots on one radio station um, where I would go in and talk about, um, you know, whatever was kind of the hot topic in education at that time, SAT prep, um, FAFSA, things like that. And then the other radio station, they would allow me to um, record um, nonprofit, they have a nonprofit commercial option. Um, so at that I had a very short amount of time to do a commercial, like I only had 30 seconds um, or less of a commercial. I think it was way less than that. Um, but they would allow me to come in and record a, a brief commercial. So I'm thinking that's going to be a way that we promote our programs in the fall, whether or not we're in the schools. Um, because I think parents um, can so easily throw away the envelope when they don't know what it is. I like to tell the story that when I was in someplace in middle school, I received a, a mailing from Educational Talent Search and my mother wouldn't let me join because she thought it was a scam. Um, because she thought the name was strange. She's like, well, if they're looking for guitar players or whatever, like you're not, you know, they, she thought it was like some sort of star search thing. Um, <laughs> so she didn't let me join. Um, and it was kind of funny because we probably would have been qualified. Um, but so I'm trying to get our name available in the community, um, even if it's subconsciously through the radio. Um, and I also work a lot with our local TV station um, so that they promote us. Um, I do, again, I do regular spots on the morning news. Um, I drive two hours to the news station for 6 a.m. I do a 10 minute spot and then I drive the two hours home. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a great way to reach the entire um, community. That's great, Katie. And I was going to ask, do anyone else, um, is anyone else familiar or do anything with podcasting um, and have equipment? Because that's what we're thinking about on my team as well. And what's the proper equipment and things that people are using. But that's great that you're doing all that. I really commend you. That's what's Thank up. you. I, and I'm, I am starting podcasting, so I can send you the resources that I have. Um, I haven't set it up yet. Um, my plan is to like work through it all summer and then have Episode, so I can have episodes that go live every week um, through starting in the fall. Um, so I want to pre-record a bunch of stuff. Um, but yeah, podcasts. New way of thinking about the same thing, Kelly and Deons, right? Doing some podcasts. I've already uh, assigned my my staff who have the voices for that and the, the energy. So yes, yeah, so we've been thinking about doing the same thing. And I was worried too about equipment. What do I need to get them so we can get started and that kind of stuff. So Awesome. Can you send those resources? Maybe, I don't know if it's too big to send in the chat, but could you send that resource out? I'd be interested in getting that to do. Um, the, the podcast stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, okay. If you want your the information, I, um, I don't have the links available all right now um, to what I'm using, um, but I can, if you, how, if you email me, at mycap-president at eoa.org. I'm going to take down as many emails as I see in the um, chat box, but if I miss you, um, email me and I'll send that stuff to you. I'm super excited. Like, I've been nerding out 
That was, and that's actually part of the way we used our STEM money um, because we can then use it in the future to teach students that aspect. Kaylee, can you also put your email in the chat box so oh, sure. we can get it that way? Thank you. All right, I will go back and add these because they are coming at a rate that I cannot type that quick. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Kaylee, you could also save that chat if you wanted to when we're done, so you don't have to worry about copying them down. Yep, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, it looks like a lot of people are thinking on podcasting. Yeah, it's a great, and it's it's another one of those things that you, students then can take it with them. Um, if they have a cell phone, a smartphone, and they can eat, well, they can download it, they can listen to it through their data. It's a great resource. Um, so going back to recruitment purposes, um, Ashley says that they've um, reached out to counselors um, to email students with GPA and other requirements. Um, and they have a Google form attached to the email. That's awesome. So then they know. Um, and you got, wow, you got 30 people already for next year. That's awesome. Yeah, I can speak to this a minute. Um, it actually turned out really well. That's only from one school, 30. So we're now doing this to our other schools um, as well. So it's like an email and we, we wrote it like kind of like a nice acceptance, like you have been honored or appreciated or your grades or your GPA, you know, like something to, to advertise like that they've worked hard and that they've been selected to be in the program. And, um, and then in the email, it just kind of talks about our services and stuff. And there's a form. The form is simple. It is their name, address, phone number, or yeah, phone number, so that they are giving us the information. Um, and then we mailed out an application with a return envelope so that they could then just put the application in and mail it back to us. Um, we have still had a couple missing information that I've had to resend and or make a copy of it and then send that back to them with another postage so that's why we are super excited online as well to have those um, parts that are unable to skip and, and bypass so but it, it is um, working for now and um, we're hoping to to reach out to the other schools and do the same thing that's awesome Um, is there anything that I, I've, um, I've missed in the chat box or is there anything else anyone wants to uh, discuss here? Is there a way that we have, um, we ensure that our email is included so we can get the notes and some of the information that we've shared here on um, this call? Yep, if, um, so if you wanna put your email address in the, um, in the chat box, I will, um, I've saved the chat um, stream and I will go back and email, what I will do is um, this weekend, I will go back through and take all of the resources um, that we've got um, coming through and send them out to everybody um, so that we, okay, we, great. we get all these. Because yeah, you guys have got some great ideas. Um, if I can just take a moment to commend you for all the work you're doing. Um, there's a, <clears throat> I literally am speechless. 
um, when it comes to when I think about the amount of work that educators have had to do to turn their entire systems upside down. Um, teachers had to do it and, um, and TRIO had to do it. We had to do it for both our own services and to match up with our schools and to make sure we're supporting our students in their school systems. So I commend you guys for all the work. I know um, and we hear people saying you're working evenings, um, you know, we're connect you're connected at all times so that students can reach you. That's fantastic. And I know that that is um, emotionally draining in the line of um, everything going on, but um, thank you so much. Our, your students will remember this. Um, you know, they, our students don't even understand, I think, that, you know, in 20 years, this is going to be the big topic in a textbook um, that they lived through. And this could change, this is changing the face of education right now. Um, so I know a lot of people are saying another meeting would be really helpful. I will pass that on to President uh, Stewart um, and ask her if we can continue um, having these I know we, have this, we said the same thing in Michigan when we did our program roundtables, that we need to start having them more regularly. So, um, I guess, at, unless, like I said, unless there's anything else that people um, want to discuss. We're open for a few more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hearing, uh, or rather not seeing anything new come through, thank you guys very much for your time today. Um, it's greatly appreciated, and, um, and we will hopefully see you all soon, um, whether that be in another virtual format, or um, I guess, it, hopefully, and hopefully we will all see each other in November at the EOA conference. Um, so, uh, I do see how you know about these in advance. These are coming out through the EOA email and email, um, list. So if you are a member of EOA, um, you will get them regularly. Um, so, uh, or you'll get updates about what's going on. So thank you guys so much. Have a fantastic weekend and get some rest. Um, it's been a long few weeks, but get some rest. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks thank so much. you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Good weekend. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great weekend. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Thanks for moderating, Kaylee. Thanks, Shola. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Talk soon. Thanks again. This was great. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks for Kaylee. participating. <laughs> Thanks. It's really helpful to hear other people's ideas. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I was really pulling my hair, girl. So <laughs> as soon as I clicked in, I had like two notes. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so we really do appreciate it. Keep it up. Keep it up. Anything that you need from us, I put our, we put our email down. Let us know, okay? Awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm.